Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here, ready for our marathon, Marathon Thursday. Three lectures here in one. This will take care of gastrointestinal pathology for the week. And we did two hours of endocrinology, which is also included in this class. Monday and, I forget, was it Tuesday? Yeah, here we go. All right, pernicious anemia is kind of the star of the show today. Uh, it's an anemia that occurs because something goes wrong with intrinsic factor. About 85% of the time, it's secondary to an autoimmune attack against parietal cells, intrinsic factor, cabam receptors, and more. And we'll talk more about it, but we need to do a little talk about vitamin B12 because that's kind of the star of the show, right? Uh, it has to be bound to intrinsic factor in order for B12 to get into our bloodstream. A tiny bit of it can be absorbed through regular enterocytes, but most of it can't. And furthermore, it has to be absorbed in the distal ileum. Right? That distal ileum, you know a disease that hits the distal ileum? Crohn's disease. Right? So this is a common in people with Crohn's disease. So if any component of B12, the B12 absorption story is broken, you can end up with a vitamin B12 deficiency, which leads to the symptoms of pernicious anemia, and we'll get into that. Vitamin B12 deficiency causes, I swore I talked about, well, maybe let me keep going. It seems like I'm missing some slides. Anyway, B12 deficiency causes megaloblastic anemia. Uh, and in fact, vitamin B12 deficiency is the most common cause of megaloblastic anemia. Folic acid deficiency, vitamin B9, can be very similar to vitamin B12 deficiency. There's some similarities. Vitamin B12 usually gets more, uh, can get the nervous system. Folic acid can, but it doesn't as readily as vitamin B12. Certain medications can mess up. We'll look at all the causes of vitamin B12 deficiency in a little bit here. But the disease interferes with DNA synthesis. Um, and there's other diseases that can interfere with DNA synthesis, especially in the bone marrow. HIV, megal uh, Myeloblastic disorders like the leukemias can also do the same thing. Megaloblastic anemia, uh, again, vitamin B12 and B9 are both mandatory for DNA synthesis, uh, especially during two processes, hematopoiesis, the making of red blood cells, especially red blood cells, and for myelin sheath synthesis, you need vitamin B12. That's not a good thing to get screwed up, is it? Myelin, remember that's like the insulation around your uh, around your wires, right? If you have a axon here, remember the myelinated story, uh, or even if you have a wire, you have you have these myelin. It's myelinated like this by Schwann cells in the PNS, and those are important for a number of reasons. One of which is for kind of making it work better and not short circuiting. This myelin has to be replaced all the time, and you need vitamin B12 for the protein synthesis and the DNA synthesis necessary to do this. So very important. You can start getting short circuits because of that. Specifically, B decreased B12 and B9 results in underdeveloped blood cells, especially red blood cells, uh, where they have cytoplasm volumes. It looks like there's more cytoplasm, but that's really because the nucleus is tiny, usually. Uh, there's called a nuclear cytoplasmic disassociation seen in megaloblastic anemia patients. Uh, also, gigantic white blood cells. Uh, some of the beans, the basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils, remember they usually have three segments in them. They have five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're hypersegmented. White blood cells are huge. Uh, they're all weirdly shaped. Cut a lot of this stuff out. You're going to learn this when you get to with Dr. Dumane with blood chemistry, so I'm not going to go too far out of this stuff. But uh, Remember where intrinsic factor comes from. Remember the hipster. Google says this is a hipster. Uh, and hipster stands for the 
juices that flow out of the parietal gland. Hydrochloric acid, intrinsic factor, and pepsinogen are the hipster. Um, so intrinsic factor, it's a glycoprotein made by parietal cells uh, in the oxentic glands or the fundic glands, a.k.a., uh, along with hydrochloric acid, remember hip. Its job is to bind to vitamin B12 in the duodenum and then chaperone it into the distal ileum, which we're going to talk about more about. Okay, here's the slides. I thought I started those first, but nevertheless, here we go. We need to talk about cobalamin. I want you to memorize this structure. No, I wouldn't do that. That's biochemistry, but if you're biochemistry, you might have to memorize something like that. But vitamin B12 is also called cobalamin. It's a water soluble. It's not one of the who's the fat soluble? No no chiropractor, young chiropractor named Deke. And that's those are fat soluble vitamins. That's how I remember them. Uh, but vitamin B12 is water. Do we store? Do we usually store water soluble vitamins? No, we usually don't. This is an exception, though. Uh, its job is, amongst other things, to maintain the myelin in sheath and uh, to its instrumental in the synthesis of uh, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, uh, needed to build blood cells, especially red blood cells. It's also a molecule that our bodies can't make in adequate supplies can't be made by animal or plant. If you're a bacteria or algae, you can make a little bit of it, um, but we, we have to get it through the diet, right? So therefore, the human is almost 100% dependent on dietary vitamin B12 for normal health. Tiny bit, we can make a little bit, not enough to keep us alive, but we do have some gut bacteria that can make a little bit of B12. Uh, but not nearly enough. Our daily requirements are 2 to 3 micrograms. The weird thing about vitamin B12 is it can be stored in the liver. There's an R behind there. Stored in the liver. And not just stored. I mean, it can really be stored. A couple years, one to two years, it can be stored in the liver for. That's crazy for a water-soluble vitamin, but that's one of the rare exceptions of water-soluble vitamins. Right? Well, what kind of foods? My favorite food, egg. My least favorite food, liver. My, I don't know, because I'm allergic to this one. I only had it once, and I almost uh, ended up in the ER with anaphylaxis, so I can't eat shellfish. So it tasted good well, from what I remember. Um, but eggs, I do like my eggs. We'll talk about eggs and CVPP. They're not all that bad, you know, like they used to think they were. Uh, they can be stored in the liver, as we said, for years, a couple years worth. So the liver is a storage, a storage reservoir for vitamin B12. It's a rare example of water-soluble vitamin being stored. Okay, So if you get shipwrecked on a desert island like Tom Hanks, uh, what was that movie, Survivor? And you don't have any B12, you can live for quite a while. All right, uh, pure vegetarians have to be careful. They can get their B12 from yeast and other sources. Sorry about the noise. Nothing I can do, these neighbors. Don't get me started. Um, how to get B12 in the bloodstream. This is actually quite important. Uh, so let's go through the steps. I want you to know this. Look at all the stars. I can't even fit more stars on here. Uh, so B12 is strongly attached uh, to food. We'll just call them food binding proteins. How about that? We don't have to memorize them all. B12 doesn't like to travel along, uh, alone. Uh, and this binding will be broken as we go through this process. But uh, mastication, you start chewing up the food, food binding protein is not going to be dislodged by that. It does trigger the release of salivary enzymes, uh, stimulates the vagus nerve to get all sorts of gastric juice flowing down there. 
the process of uh, deglutition when the food is masticated enough. Uh, the process of swallowing is called deglutition. If you don't know those, add those to your vocabulary list. Uh, B12 is still bound to the food binding protein when you swallow it. Um, but all that chewing, there's an enzyme uh, called heptochorin that's really important. And that's a salivary enzyme. Uh, it's also called the R protein or the R factor. Uh, transcobalamin 1, which is good because there's a transcobalamin 2, uh, or holoheptochorin. Uh, technically speaking, that should be called holoheptochorin because that gets away from all the other, con uh, everything else is kind of confusing. Uh, it is secreted by salivary glands during mastication, as I said. And yeah, we won't, this, who are the salivary glands? Parotid gland, submandibular gland, sublingual gland. Uh, heptochorin mixes in with the bolus and just travels down. It doesn't bind to anybody as you're chewing things up. It travels down to the stomach, uh, and now it plops in the stomach, and it's sitting there. Has it done anything yet? Here is the binding protein. It, here, there's B12. Notice together they are being swallowed right here. And heptochrin is this little Lego. It doesn't come out very good there. Sometimes this marker doesn't do the greatest. All right, so they go down, kaplunk in the stomach. In the stomach, B12 is broken loose from food binding protein uh, by pepsin. Remember, pepsin is secreted by the chief cells in pepsinogen form, and then that's uh, the acid breaks it loose, it cleaves off the tail, and creates pepsin. So pepsin, without pepsin, you're going to have vitamin B12 deficiency. Let me say that again. Without pepsin, you're going to have, or pepsinogen for that matter, and without acid, you're not going to be able to digest vitamin B12. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay, and again, pepsin is released from chief cells of the oxentic glands uh, almost immediately when pepsin breaks loose the food binding protein heptochrin is right there and immediately grabs vitamin b12 in the two hold hands and heptochrin is going to chaperone vitamin b12 out of the stomach b12 would be quickly destroyed by the acid environment of the stomach if if this quick binding didn't happen it can't live in the acid environment very long but there's plenty of heptochrin to kind of do the job here. Uh, intrinsic factor, kind of like heptochrin was released into the mouth. Intrinsic factor was also released into the stomach juice, but it doesn't do anything in the stomach. It just kind of uh, floats around. It's resistant to the acid. Uh, makes sense. I mean, it was born out of the same cell, but the parietal cell secreted both of it. Uh, and then, yeah, so then what happens next is the heptochrin and B12 and intrinsic factor get ejected out of the stomach uh, and they enter the duodenum. And now something else is going to happen. Uh, so does, um, in the duodenum, pancreatic proteases, we'll just leave it at that. Pancreatic proteases break loose the vitamin B12 from heptochrin. And now B12 is naked and alone once again. Almost immediately B12 binds to the new character. So intrinsic factor is right there uh, to hold its hand. And the two bind. Okay, so here we are. Here's heptochorin binding to uh, the B12 here. Food binding protein just gets destroyed by the acid in the stomach. So heptochorin, B12 go out. There's intrinsic factor, they're kind of together. Uh, and these guys, uh, th once they get down here by the pancreas, proteases break loose the vitamin B12 from heptochorin, and there's intrinsic factor immediately binds to it. And now we have a happy couple, intrinsic factor and B12, holding hands and heading toward the distal part of the ileum. 
Now, my favorite pitcher, uh, Kabam. Remember these old Batman pitchers? Kabam. Uh, so intrinsic factor in B12 complex move through the small bowel uh, until they reach the distal ilium. The next thing that happens, happens is this complex, intrinsic factor B12, binds to Kabam receptors, specifically to cubulin receptors, uh, AKA is Kabam receptors, but they're more commonly known as cubulin. So you need to know both of those. There's a bunch of AKAs for this. You don't need to know all of those things. Uh, these receptors only live in the distal part of the ileum. Therefore, that's the only place you can get B12 in to the bloodstream. Via endocytosis, the entire complex is then swallowed uh, through the cell. I mean, here's an enterocyte in the distal ileum, and here's a Kabam receptor sticking up like this, and then here is our intrinsic factor holding hands with B12. Oh, I love that sound, don't you? He could shut his garage door and it wouldn't be as bad. Anyway, um, so this is by endocytosis, this whole thing is swallowed into the cell. Okay, so cool. We have blood vessels down here, right? So we don't have too much further to go um, before. We got to spit it out the basal lateral surface. Um, but that's the deal with this so far. Amazingly, B12 gets released. Uh, so they get so once they get in the cell, did I, where did that, oh, there it is, the lysosome. Uh, so once this complex is taken into the cell, the lysosome, which is like a death star, uh, it swallows it, and now it's in its tummy. Uh, so amazingly, the B12 is not damaged, and we don't know the mechanism behind that. How the lysosome spares it, we don't know. Um, but it is kicked out of the lysosome then, and it spit out the basal lateral part of the cell, and now it's in the interstitium alone again. Um, so intrinsic factor is destroyed inside the lysosome, but not B12. So now it's alone, but once it's out the basolateral surface and in the interstitium, uh, the enterocytes of the distal ileum also produce a partner for the B12 called transcobalamin 1. Remember one AKA for heptocorin was transcobalamin 1. Did I say one? They produce transcobalamin 2, uh, these enterocytes, as ileoenterocytes. So it's waiting for B12, and they hook up together, and now they're escorted from the interstitium into the capillaries, uh, and they're dumped into the intestinal veins, remember these things, the superior mesenteric vein, into the hepatic bordal vein, and now they're off, they're in the liver now, uh, and then they're circulated to the whole body and they get into the bone marrow. Remember your anatomy here. Uh, here's a portal vein, and remember that splits into the splenic, and the major, these uh, superior mesenteric vein, and these were all intestinal veins. Oh wait, those are the, uh, those are the colic, right colic veins. Where's the intestinal? Here's the little intestinals. But remember we saw those, they were really, thick coming off that superior mesenteric artery. All right, so that's kind of the pathway they take. They get up in here into the liver. So that's cool. Um, and there's just a cartoon showing B12, an intrinsic factor, binding to the, the enterocytes here, being taken in, destroyed, and then we didn't show the interstitium uh, but the B12 hooks up with transcobalamin 2, and it's carried into the liver and into the bone marrow where it's needed uh, for DNA synthesis and myelinin synthesis. Right, everything I just said there. Okay, great. And again, it's important for hematopoiesis and myelin sheath repair and, uh, and regeneration. So super important for that stuff. Uh, is there another way to get B12 into the bloodstream? Well, as I said at the beginning, B12 can be directly absorbed by passive diffusion in any enterocyte, even in the duodenum, but it's terribly inefficient. At the most, only 1% of B12 
can be taken in through the regular enterocytes, and that's not enough to sustain life, unfortunately. Okay, um, so yeah, but we can use this if you're just starting out uh, and you have early pernicious anemia, you can actually megadose or superdose B12 and avoid those injections, but ultimately you're going to be up, end up taking uh, these intramuscular injections of B12, uh, which work. I mean, that fixes your problem. Uh, you can have permanent serious neurological damage uh, for vitamin B12 deficiency, which can be, can be completely avoided if you take injections of B12. Okay. Now let's go back to pernicious anemia. Uh, again, no matter what the cause, I see I kind of have double slides here, but no matter what the cause, uh, pernicious anemia is caused by a vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 just doesn't get in the blood. We'll look at all the different ways. And vitamin B12 deficiency is the number one cause of megaloblastic anemia. That's the parent category. It has several children. It has vitamin B12 deficiency. It has folic acid deficiency is another cause. I think those are the two uh, main causes of it. Uh, but yeah, megaloblastic anemia is an anemia, as we'll see. And I, I took all these slides out because I'm not a hematologist. I, I think that you have a hematology class, I think. Um, this is cardiovascular pathology. Uh, but anyway, this is a blood slide. There's a normal red blood cell right there with that pale. You probably have this already, that pale center. But look at how giant these red blood cells are. And they're not even, they're immature. They're not even developed. Uh, they're as big as the monocyte here. They should never be that big. There's another ne normal one right here. Uh, see, they're way bigger than that. And then look at this neutrophil. Or is this a eosinophil? It's one of the beans. Uh, it's got way too many lobes. They should never have. It's an eosinophil, I think. It should never have more than three lobes. It's got six lobes. So this is an abnormal slide. This person uh, has megaloblastic anemia. Right? And there's several different types we're going to look at, pernicious anemia A and pernicious anemia B, uh, and there's a bunch of pernicious anemias. Uh, so we'll look at those. By far the most common is called pernicious anemia A. And the A, guess what that stands for? Autoimmune disease. So it's an autoimmune attack, and we'll look at here in a second what it gets attacked. Uh, what's the pathophysiology of pernicious anemia? Uh, well, by B12 deficiency, we said this already, results in megaloblastic anemia and its sequelae. We've already said this as well, uh, but kind of a recap. The sequelae of megaloblastic anemia is screwed up DNA synthesis. It doesn't work. Therefore, you get huge immature red blood cells. They don't carry oxygen worth beans. Patients get run-of-the-mill anemic symptoms at first, tired and their skin gets pale from not enough oxygen and you get multi-segmented beans, basal cells, eosinophils, neutrophils, uh, and then screwed up myelin sheath repair. Uh, so those are some of the sequelae of this. Early or classic early symptoms uh, include just all, all anemias present like this tachycardia and tach why would you have tachypnea and tachycardia you're breathing your respirations a little crease your heart's going faster because these immature red blood cells are not very good at carrying oxygen how are you going to make up for that you're going to have to move the blood faster and that's why the heart beats f harder and the, the lungs have to keep up with the heart you're fatigued you can have dizziness uh, for just not great blood uh, oxygen supply to the brain. You certainly have dyspnea on exertion. You, you're already running low on O2. Uh, muscle weakness and pain. Pale skin is classic. Diarrhea. Uh, these are all classic symptoms of anemia. But from this symptom list, you can't tell it's megaloblastic anemia until you start getting into the more advanced stages of it. Uh, so... An autoimmune attack against the parietal cells causes an inflammation in the fundic region of the stomach. Uh, that can go down into the lamina propria uh, and even the, the submucosal layer, and it can burn and irritate the nerves. The inflammation can set off the nerves, and your stomach's going to hurt. 
and we'll talk about this later, but this is called dyspepsia when your stomach is upset. Could be coming from GERD can cause dyspepsia. Uh, a sigmoid colon ulcer can cause dyspepsia. We'll look at all the causes for it in a little while. But without treatment, the fundic glands, uh, they get destroyed uh, by the uh, they get destroyed by the chronic inflammation, and that leads to something called atrophic gastritis. We will look at that. Actually, we'll look at that next week. We'll look at the dreaded gastropathies, which you're not going to like. Uh, what will the stomach look like if you go down there with an endoscope? Well, the rugae are all shriveled up because uh, of the chronic inflammation, and they're flattened out. Uh, even if in the late stages of the disease, the rugae are completely uh, gone, as we'll see here in a minute from this, this inflammation, chronic inflammatory attack. A histological evaluation shows atrophied fundic mucosa, diminished number of functioning fundic glands and parietal glands uh, are lost and destroyed, lots of scar tissue. In fact, so... Kind of a fun fact, 85% of patients with type A pernicious anemia will have developed this type of gastropathy called atrophic autoimmune gastritis. We'll look at that and all its AKAs, which are going to drive you absolutely crazy. Normal or abnormal? Well, I take a drink of water. Oh, that's a beautiful looking stomach. Look at the rugae. Normal or abnormal? Oh my God, where's the rugae? Rugae, no rugae. This is chronic uh, pernicious anemia, type A pernicious anemia, where he's it's all red looking. This is a chronic autoimmune attack and inflammation of the stomach. This has a decent chance to turn into cancer, so you have to be really careful with this one. So not good. Um, some other histological findings you can have. This is a, weird to me, this finding. But you can have intestinalization, uh, a metaplasia, where the columnar cells of the stomach are destroyed but replaced by intestinalized columnar cells with tons of goblet cells. Uh, how come? Um, that's kind of a mystery because really the stomach is not designed to take on acid environment. But is there still an acid environment if all your parietal cells are destroyed? No, there's not. So uh, we're not exactly sure how this happens, but we do know uh, intestinalization of the stomach does occur. Okay, this is a form of metaplasia, uh, and it is considered a precancer. I mean, more correctly, it's a pre precancer. Because metaplasia has to turn into dysplasia. Dysplasia has to turn into cancer in situ. So technically, it's a pre precancer, as I call it, but they never call it. They just call it precancer. Now, the condition starts going on. When it starts getting serious, you're going to start getting some neurological findings. In fact, this might even be present before you develop any blood symptoms, even before the anemia occurs in some cases. And these patients could walk right into your office thinking they have sciatica, they have bilateral leg pain, maybe a little arm pain as well. Um, um, but yeah, so nerves are being damaged because they can't replace myelin and they're short-circuiting and irritated. Um, so yeah, CNS lesions uh, are found in 75% of cases of late pernicious anemia that haven't been treated. What's the treatment again? Just vitamin B12. Oh my God, we got just the whole neighborhood is out. So sorry. Anyway, I will try to stay focused. Uh, so... What are those neurological symptoms called? Those are called symmetrical dysthesias. Symmetrical dysesthesias. And that is just like, have you ever had your arm? Of course you have. You had your hand fall asleep at night. Uh, it feels like that, only it doesn't go away. It's like that all the time. So burning, tingling, numbness. Uh, how come? Because your nerves are short-circuiting. They're spontaneously firing uh, because there's no coverings around them. The myelin is gone. 
Uh, this slide, I really like this slide. You can take this slide with you for the rest of your healthcare professional years. You will use this slide. What are some differential diagnoses for bilateral complaints of lower extremity pain or all pain in the arms and legs? They often start in the lower extremities first. First thing you think of is multiple sclerosis. Uh, there's wide, uh, chronic widespread pain syndromes as well, like fibromyalgia and central sensitization. Uh, there's small fiber neuropathies uh, from conditions of peripheral neuropathies, neuropathies that can cause this from conditions like diabetes that's not well controlled. Lyme's disease is another common one. I've caught that several times and no one's checked for that. It seems like if they go to a good neurologist, they'll check for it. But if they just stay with their primary doc, they forget to check for Lyme's disease. That can destroy nerves. Uh, and then, of course, maybe it is a real treatable problem. Maybe it's this big central disc herniation. It's crushing both of the nerves that go down the lower extremities. Another kind of rare one, I've never run into a case of this, but Guillain-Barre syndrome. I have run into Lyme's disease. I've run into all of these before except Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, some more neurological findings. There's, as they get worse, you can have ataxia. Uh, so the patient has a loss of coordination for movement. You learn how to test that. I think it's next quarter for ataxia, uh, where they ha have muscle spasticity. Uh, they get demyelination of the dorsal column, so they have wobbliness as well. The Romberg's test will be positive. Uh, their Babinski's test will be positive. Signs of upper motor neuron lesions. And as it gets really bad, you can they can have memory loss and even dementia. And hopefully, I mean, not in this country, I think by then everybody's going to be tested for B12. But it can kill you. I mean, it can ruin your life, cause dementia. And it could have been in, uh, completely prevented by simple B12 injections. Uh, let's see. Uh, so more uh, neurological findings. So... Uh, Again, I'm kind of said this typical second to uh, demyelination of the dorsal and lateral spinal tracts. Uh, so positive, you guys know this from neurology, positive Babinski's sign indicates usually a problem with the lateral tract has been degenerated, has a tumor. If they have ataxia, then it's usually a dorsal tract problem, right? Uh, sometimes you can get frank axon death instead of irritation, and that caused spastic paralysis, sensory ataxia, severe dysesthesias, uh, and uh, rarely peripheral nerve sensory loss uh, can be involved in well as well. All right, let's hit pernicious anemia type A since it is the most common. Uh, A stands for autoimmune, and it is an autoimmune attack, as we said. There's three main targets for pernicious anemia A. It can hit intrinsic factor itself after it's made and released. So I'll tell you right now, if you have the type, we'll go the we'll talk about the antibody for this, but if you have the type that attacks only intrinsic factor, is your stomach gonna be messed up? Is it? I take a drink of water. No. If it hits intrinsic factor after it leaves the stomach, the stomach's going to be fine. Okay. There's one other type that hits the Kabam receptors or the Cubulin receptors. How's your stomach going to look on endoscopic evaluation? It's going to look fine. How's the distal ileum going to look? That may be inflamed because of this. Would you have dyspeptic symptoms with intrinsic factor attack? No. Will you have dyspeptic symptoms with a Kabam receptor attack? Hmm, let's see. Well, your stomach's not going to be inflamed. That's dyspepsia, right? No, dyspepsia can can't come from anywhere in the GI tract. GERD all the way down to sigmoid colon. Sigmoid colon. So yeah, Kabam receptors in the distal ileum. So you could get inflammation of the dip, distal ileum, and you could have a dyspepsia from that. So that can... Uh, cause dyspepsia. What about parietal cells? It can certainly cause dyspepsia. Okay. All right. More about 
prayer to solve destruction. Um, trying to read a message here. Wife got chicken. Awesome. That's a hard item to find. Uh, prior to cell destruction equals decreased or no intrinsic factor, right? Because we know what prior cells, that's the hipster, right? Is that hipster? No, that's part of hipster. That's hydrochloric acid, and that's intrinsic factor. Fundic glands, is, that's where the hip, the hipster comes from. Uh, because chief cells secrete pepsinogen. But so if the parietal cells are destroyed, that's going to decrease or completely eliminate intrinsic factor. So there's no way B12 can bind to cubulin receptors. You're going to get all of these. You're going to get uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. If it hits the cubulin receptor, how are you going to get vitamin B12 into the bloodstream? No, because you the intrinsic factor and B12 complex can't be taken in to the enterocytes in the distal ileum. Therefore, they can't get into the bloodstream. Uh, how about if the inf intrinsic factor is destroyed? Nothing wrong with the stomach. Nothing wrong with the cubulin receptors. No. Intrinsic factor is needed to take vitamin B12 all the way through the intestines. Heptocorin can't make it even into the jejunum, and it gets worn out. Its job, it got tired getting out of the stomach, so it's not made to go all that far, and plus it won't bind to the cubulin receptors. So all three of these will cause vitamin B12 deficiency. Now let's go back to that. Oh, I should have asked you that before. Uh, can, can pepsinogen still be released with these three targets? Well, the parietal cell is getting hit. Chief cell is not a parietal cell. You would think so, but the trouble is collateral damage. So if you get an inflammation of the parietal cells, many chief cells are right next door. Usually the whole fundic gland gets inflamed and destroyed. Uh, so fortunately, the chief cells get destroyed through collateral damage. Right? And remember pepsin. You, get, you need pepsin, right? You need pepsin to break loose the food binding protein uh, to give heptocrine a chance to bind. So you got to have pepsin. Typical blood work in pernicious anemia A patients. So they'll have decreased hydrochloric acid. Yep. So what's a fancy word for that? Hypochlorhydria. Maybe they'll have no hydrochloric acid. That's achlorhydria. Um, what about gastrin? Well, what increases gastro blood gastrin levels? Decreased hydrogen ion in the stomach. Are we going to have decreased hydrogen ion in the stomach? Yeah, right? Yeah, pernicious anemia A. If, if the specific autoantigen uh, or autoantibody is attacking the parietal cell, yeah. Uh, so you will have hypergastrinemia in cases where it's, and we'll get specific into this, uh, but very commonly it does, it, you do have antibodies against the parietal gland. So very commonly these patients have hypergastrinemia. It's trying to, gastrin is trying to turn on stomach acid to no avail, but it keeps trying. You'll have decreased intrinsic factor. Yeah, if it's, we'll, we'll get more specific, but usually yes, and decreased pepsinogen from collateral damage. Okay, uh, autoantibodies, let's dig into these a little more uh, deeply. This is from Robin, so high-yield chiropractic board stuff here. There's three types of autoantibodies, Robin's. There's actually more than this, but Robin's talks about three of them, so that's all the deeper we'll go. Uh, it is a fairly, very reliable to make the diagnosis. Uh, and let's look at them. So we have type 1, and I guarantee you need to know these because these will be on the test. What does type 1 autoantibody do? It goes after, I always remember this type 1 looks like intrinsic factor, right? They kind of go together. Type 1 goes with intrinsic factor. Uh, this is an autoimmune attack against intrinsic factor uh, as it's ejected. So it doesn't blow up the parietal cell, but it gets intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factors binding site is destroyed and it can't hook up with B12 and therefore it can't get absorbed in the distal ileum. 
right? And you get you get decreased vitamin B12. Get vitamin B12 deficiency, and that, of course, gives you megaloblastic anemia and all those symptoms we talked about. Uh, so no inflammatory damage is seen in the stomach, right? If it's attacking intrinsic factor, it leaves the stomach alone. So therefore, these patients typically don't have any dyspepsia. It doesn't hit the Kabam receptors or anything else. It just hits that kind of naked and free intrinsic factor. Because stomach acid is working normally, there'll be no hypergastrinemia. There'll be no hypochlorhydria. Everything will be normal. About 75% of the patients have antibody, autoantibodies to type uh, 2 intrinsic factor. They have type 1 autoantibodies. The trouble, which Robbins doesn't says, the research says, uh, there's these three types of autoantibodies are often found in all in the, in the same patient. So pretty uncommon to have just one type the patient test positive for type 1 autoantibody, to my understanding. Okay, type 2 autoantibody. Uh, type 2 goes with uh, goes with Kabam receptors. I always, I don't know, this is going to work for you, but I think 2. Remember, Kabam was like a Batman and Robin thing, and there's Batman and there's Robin. Uh, so, Cubulin receptors. Type 2 autoantibodies hit Kabam receptors, uh, and they destroy that. They also can cause an inflammation of the the ileal enterocytes, which is where you're, if you're, any of those of you who are wondering one of the symptoms of diarrhea, this is where your diarrhea comes from. If you get an inflammation there, uh, that's enough to not absorb. A lot of water is also taken in in that region, and therefore you have really watery stools because if they get inflamed, they're going to not reabsorb water from the, the fecal material like they're supposed to. Uh, but if Kibam receptors blown up, B12 and intrinsic factor come on their merry way, they're all excited to hook up with the Kibam receptors, and they can't because there's an inflammation and they can't bind. So they go right out uh, into the fecal material, go out into the poop. About 75% have type 2, uh, so that was the same as type 1. Uh, so these patients, what kind of workup would you see on these patients? Uh, they'll have normal hydrochloric acid, nothing wrong with the stomach, normal gastrin levels, right? They won't have hypergastrinemia, just normal. Uh, intrinsic factors will be normal. Pepsinogen will be normal. Uh, no stomach damage would be seen uh, on a scope. But if you, I mean, we don't have a scope. We have a camera that goes into the small intestines. If you put the camera down there, you would see uh, some inflammation of the distal, of the distal ileum, and they may have dyspepsia, right, from that distal ileum inflammation. Then we come to type three autoantibodies. Uh, these are the most common. They're found in ninety percent of all people with pernicious anemia. And who do they go after? They go after the parietal cell. Now the board books. I'm not sure how deep they're going to go. They might just say parietal cells, or they might say a little more specific because they do specifically attack the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. We know exactly who they attack. Uh, so the inflammation will take out the whole parietal cell. It'll take out the chi. It'll take out much of the entire fundic gland uh, because of that inflammation. And so this is definitely going to result in a stomach wall irritation, inflammation. They're going to have dyspepsia. They're going to have decreased acid. They're going to have decreased intrinsic factor. They're going to have decreased pepsinogen, uh, decreased pepsin. What about gastrin? What about gastrin? Normal, increase, decrease? Well, there's nothing. This is not an attack. Parietal cells don't live. Where the G cells, remember, G cells are in the are in the pyloric region, or the antral region, whichever you want to say. They're away from the fundic region. They're not going to get. They're working, uh, so they're going to sense decreased hydrogen ion. They're going to crank out gastrin like crazy. So you're going to have hypergastrinemia uh, in this condition with type three autoantibodies. Everybody good with that? 
Uh, patients will have concomitant hypergastrinemia. Hypochlorhydra just said that. They will also have dyspepsia. We said that as well because there's an inflammation of their stomach line, of the fundic region of the stomach. There's some associated conditions that are always good to know. Um, patients with type A pernicious anemia in particular, uh, they always should be checked for diabetes mellitus, especially type 1, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is, what is that, hyper or hypothyroidism? Hashimoto's is hypothyroidism, uh, and vitiligo. So these are all inflammatory autoimmune diseases that tend to kind of cluster together. Some other associations with this destructive type A pernicious anemia. Uh, the fundic region gets so destroyed in some of these uh, cases uh, that gastric carcinoma often happens if no treatment occurs. Uh, it's not a one-fold increase or four-fold, five-fold, which is significant. It's a 26-fold increase. So there is a decent chance that if the patient lives long enough, they're going to develop uh, stomach cancer from this, specifically of the fundic region of the stomach. They also, we don't know why this is, but they also tend to de uh, develop iron deficiency anemia. About 25% of these patients have double anemia, myeloblastic anemia, and iron deficiency anemia. Reason is unknown. Uh, as we said, people tend to get Hashimoto's. Uh, about 10% of people develop that type of thyroiditis. Some other findings. Uh, doc, let's see, who teaches that? I don't think Dr. Demonier teaches it. Dr. Giador, uh, Mary Jo teaches it. I don't, the other Dr. G is teaching this now. But she'll go over the atrophic gastritis that affects the tongue. Uh, so a certain chunk of people have this autoimmune attack of the tongue, some antigens in the tongue, which I won't get into. Let her get into that. But it makes the tongue look beefy and shiny and glazy and bald looking. So that's called atrophic glass, uh, glossitis is a common uh, condition with this. All right, so that was type A. There is a type B pernicious anemia. This is not caused by an autoimmune attack at all. Guess what B stands for? That's how I remember it. Some of you got it. Bug. B stands for bug. Uh, it's caused by the dreaded. H. pylori, which we will talk about. I'm sure Dr. Doe has talked about this. I took most of my slides out. I really got into this bug because it's a very, probably the number one cause of chronic stomach pain is H. pylori. Uh, it causes something called atrophic multifocal gastritis. Better to say multifocal atrophic gastritis. One of the gastropathies. We'll be talking about that next week. Uh, it's caused by a chronic HP infection, which really destroys the fundic glands more than the, the antral region. I mean, it really destroys everything, though. Uh, HP usually starts in the antrum and messes that up, stimulates the G cells to overproduce gastrin. That's always a bad combination. You get huge levels of acid secretion. Uh, but then it focuses on the fundic region in the chronic phases, and it can just rip the stomach to pieces. Therefore, you get decreased hydrochloric acid, decreased pepsin, decreased intrinsic factor. The entire stomach can be destroyed. Uh, so sometimes you don't have any hypergastrinemia. You might even have hypogastrinemia in this condition. Uh, additional blood testing, you won't find any antibodies for this type of pernicious anemia. Uh, so this is number one suspect if antibody testing comes back negative. Uh, you will have signs of megaloblastic anemia, though, with this, or any type of pernicious anemia. All of them I'm talking about, so I could have taken this out, really. Uh, but you'll have immature, oversized, overlobulated blood cells. Uh, and we'll find decreased levels of B12. Another type of... This is pretty rare, but there is a congenital pernicious anemia, and the AKA is intrinsic factor deficiency. So it's an autosomal recessive disorder. Occurs when the genes that create intrinsic factor are mutated. So we have parietal cell mutations, some of the genes that manufacture. We didn't get into that, but 
There's a process to make intrinsic factor. They're mutated and you get a intrinsic factors that's broken. It doesn't work or it doesn't work very good. And if intrinsic factor doesn't work, it can't bind to vitamin B12. And there you go. Vitamin B12 deficiency, which leads, which causes megaloblastic anemia. And what else? So these patients don't have antibodies either, right? There's no sign of autoimmune uh, atrophic gastritis. Stomach lining is not damaged, right? It's just a, it's just a mutation. There's no inflammation involved here. Um, they still get pernicious anemia, though, and B12 deficiency and megaloblastic anemia. Uh, but uh, they typically don't have dysphagia, so this is usually not a cause of, uh, sorry, dyspepsia. That's an S. I need a, one of those pens like you guys have. Gastric and hydrochloric acid levels will be normal. Of course they will. Uh, no, no hypochlorhydria or achlorhydria, no hypergastrinemia. You'll do an examination of your stomach. How will that look? It looks great. The only test that will be positive is you don't, you're not making intrinsic factor. Another type, how about malabsorptive pernicious anemia? Sometimes called MPA or malabsorptive isn't that the same word? Malabsor malabsorption, oh, pernicious anemia. Many conditions can screw up the mechanisms we talked about, the pathway of vi that vitamin B12, uh, vitamin B12 travels. For example, there are rare gene mutations uh, with heptocorin. And if heptocorin doesn't work, you can't bind vitamin B12 in the stomach. Um, so there's a bunch of them. We're not going to get into them too much, but collectively they're called malabsorptive pernicious anemia. Oh, I guess we are going to. I thought I took these out, but I guess I didn't. Uh, so there are proton pump gene mutations where you don't make hydrochloric acid. Well, if you don't make hydrochloric acid, what's that got to do with intrinsic factor? You're cranking out intrinsic factor just fine. So here's my question. Could be a test question. How can a mutation for in the gene that makes proton pumps or hydrogen potassium ATPases, how can that cause pernicious anemia? Do we need hydrochloric acid for that vitamin B12 story? Yeah, we need it uh, because without hydrochloric acid, we need pepsin, right? How do you get pepsin? Pepsinogen won't do the trick. You have to have pepsin to break loose the food binding protein. Ah, now you see. So kind of indirectly, we need the hydrochloric acid uh, to cleave the tail off the pepsinogen to make pepsin, and then pepsin can break loose the food binding protein. Heptocrine can grab that vitamin B12, and everybody's happy. Got it? Everything I said there. Uh, so these people will have, will they have hypergastrinemia? Of course they will. If they can't make hydrochloric acid, G cells are going to freak out and they're always going to be making gastro. In fact, they're going to become hypertrophic from making so much gastro. And that whole system is going to be ramped up to no avail uh, because they can't make hydrochloric acid or it's deformed. They'll have hypochlorhydria, they'll have achlorhydria. Will they have stomach upset? No, no inflammation, no autoimmune attack, no dyspepsia. Pancreatic insufficiency. Something's wrong with the pancreatic proteases. Remember I said anything in that chain that you learned, can anything that goes wrong uh, will cause vitamin B12 insufficiency. So if something goes wrong, if there's a gene mutation for making the, uh, the pancreatic proteases, if you want to get specific, uh, the uh, trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen are the ones that really... Uh, break off heptocrine and give intrinsic factor a chance to bind. But B12 uh, cannot be released from heptocrine then. And heptocrine and B12, heptocrine can't make it all the way down and it breaks loose and B12 just floats down and floats right on by the distal ileum and can't be bound. Okay, so no hypergastrinemia, 
uh, no the stomach there's nothing wrong with the stomach so G cells are quiet uh, the hydrogen is being produced hydrochloric acid is being produced as normal how about another one distal ileal disease oh who loves the distal ileum Crohn's disease we will get to Crohn's disease I'm confident this quarter I got an extra lecture because you know uh, what is that thing? CCEP test, right? So that's one full lecture you get. Uh, there's, I don't think there's any days off that I know of. But anyway, we will get to Crohn's disease. But uh, Crohn's disease patients are at risk for developing pernicious anemia. There's no doubt about it. Okay, how come? The Crohn's disease is an inflammatory disease and it damages the cabam receptors or the cubulin receptors and then b12 and intrinsic factor can't hook up what about hypergastrinemia there's nothing wrong with the stomach so no hypergastrinemia no achlorhydria no hypochlorhydria all that stuff is working fine parasites tapeworms not so much in this country but tapeworms actually love b12 it's like a scooby snack do they still have that movie that what was that Scooby Scooby Doo that cartoon? I never really liked it that much, honestly. It's too silly for me. Uh, but tapeworms. Tapeworms can eat B12 like candy. Uh, and therefore there's nothing wrong with any of the machinery. It's just the fact that B12 is not even making it to the distal ileum because the tapeworm is eating it. And therefore, will they have hyperchlorhydria? No. Will they have hypergastrinemia? No. Everything will be fine. Will they have stomach upset? They might, but not because of anything we're talking about. The tapeworm could uh, burl into the, the intestinal wall and irritate that and cause inflammation. Are we done? No. This is probably where I usually would take a break. How far did are we gone here? 90 slides, 70 slides. All right, so we got maybe about 30 more or so. So disorders of the stomach, so we need to talk about some pain first, but nearly one-third of all health care spending in the U.S. goes to GI disease. Huge problem. I mean, in this, when I was going through my GI stuff with GERD, uh, it would take me seven months to get into Stanford or different places. It's just ridiculous. There's so many people with this problem. It causes really bad mor morbidity in people. They can't eat. They can't go out can't drink a glass of wine. It's just a terrible problem. I know students, several students have had have this already, and they have trouble at your age. Inflammatory diseases, uh, neoplastic conditions also can occur. Gastric carcinoma, not so much in this country, but it's one of the leading causes of death worldwide. So as we have already told you, but let's make it official, stomach upset or your upset tummy that's called dyspepsia and we're going to look at a cluster of symptoms that make the diagnosis of dyspepsia okay so there's a dyspepsia symptom complex that we need to memorize uh, so one of the most common gastrointestinal complaints, uh, we go on and on about, yeah, we know it's common. It's a big problem. Greek word for dyspepsia means difficult digestion. Uh, it does not always associate with eating. We'll learn about feeding certain types of ulcers and uh, things like that. But approximately 28% of the, look at this number. This is not 0.01%. 28% of the general population has uh, experiences daily or at least monthly dy dyspeptic symptoms and uh, usually they don't seek medical care because after they wait six months to get in to see the doc specialist they can get better with the passage of time uh, most of these people have at least two or three members of this dyspepsia symptom complex uh, so we'll look at that. When's it coming? Not yet. Uh, about 50% of people who suffer dyspepsia will actually have they get better without any treatment. Uh, many people get better and cancel their appointments. That's why if you really want to get into a GI doc, uh, just keep calling every day for cancellations because they do happen. As people just they wait so long they get better. 
Okay, we'll soon learn that there's two types of dyspepsia. There's a organic dyspepsia and a functional dyspepsia. And the, the clinical dyspepsia symptom complex, CDSC. So in real clinical practice, there are eight patient complaints or symptoms that will tick the diagnosis of dyspepsia. And uh, this has been called the clinical dyspepsia symptom complex. Uh, this is really, we said there's two types of dyspepsia. This is really designated for uh, functional dyspepsia and not so much for organic, although we use it for the same thing. Here it is. You need to memorize this. I guarantee you questions are coming on this. So, and we'll explain some of these. Like, and these are in order. The number one complaint that patients, a patient makes, and this might not be intuitive to you, number one complaint that they hear based on the research is something called bothersome postprandial fullness. Another word is f they get full. They don't have pain, but they sit down to eat a meal with their family and they take two bites and they're uncomfortably full already. So that's not normal, and that's their number one complaint. I can't, Doc, I can't go out to dinner with my husband. I can't. I have uh, bread for appetizer, and I'm full. And I eat a little bit of, or I have, you know, how they bring you the breadsticks, or they used to bring you the breadsticks out. Uh, and you eat bread, and I'm full. I can't eat. And then my appetizers, and I eat one of those, and I'm, I'm, my stomach's starting to hurt. It's getting so full. I can't even, I'll eat a salad. I can't even eat that. That's not normal, and that's about 90% of the time that's the main complaint that people have. Number two complaint is bloating. They get really gassy after they eat, which seems to go along commonly with this one, belching, which is, I think people just don't admit it. I think it's belching is probably and bloating go together. But on this list that's down there, some people even experience a nausea after they eat. Another common one is called early satiation, satiation. Uh, what is that? That's the inability to eat a full meal without pain starting. It's very similar to bothersome postprandial fullness, only this one's early satiation is if they eat more than a, if they eat a full meal, they'll have pain in their stomach. This one, they just get full and they have no, they don't want to eat anymore. This one's flat out pain. Uh, belching, we talked about epigastric burning. What does that sound like? We talked all about that, right? GERD. So GERD can definitely cause dyspepsia. And then some people just have vomiting. Here's a famous study uh, done back in the day when it was at 2016. And I think the study was older. That was from Schleisinger 2014. But it just shows these bloating and fullness uh, are the two top symptoms, uh, yeah, et cetera. Everything, I just listed them all. Organic versus functional dyspepsia. There are two types of dyspepsia, as we said. Organic dyspepsia uh, means that they go in there with endoscope and they actually find a problem. So 30% of people under medical testing, they'll find a cause for their dyspepsia, and then they get the diagnosis, organic dyspepsia. Functional dyspepsia is the big one. 70% of people, they can't find out what's wrong with them. Um, they fall into the functional dyspepsia category. Let's talk about organic dyspepsia. Uh, so what are some of the causes? Big one is GERD. Yeah, there's an overlap with symptoms. Organic dyspepsia, uh, GERD is the diagnosis in about 20% of the cases. The gastropathies that we're going to talk about, uh, you can call them gastropathies or gastritis. Is not all stomach problems are inflammatory. So gastritis, is, which Robbins uses, is not a great term because there's some that have nothing to do with inflammation. But about 50% of people, they do some testing and they go down there with an endoscope and they have an ulcer or they have red spot in their stomach. Uh, that's gastritis. Uh, 
if they have a flat out ulcer, then they don't have gastritis, then they have PUD, peptic ulcer disease. About 7% have that. Carcinoma, 1% of people, they go down with endoscope and lo and behold, the problem, the dyspepsia they have is caused by cancer. Pancreatic disorders, now these are less than 1%. Like that, what is that one we've heard? They, God, they've just spent so much money on that. Uh, EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Boy, they're pushing that so hard on the radio. That is such a rare disease, according to the research. They're just selling some new drug for it. Uh, but pancreatic disorders are a rare cause. It could be mistaken for dyspepsia, but it's very unlikely. Uh, what's, it's not this weird EPI that's causing your problem. It's probably GERD. It's a gastritis, usually from HP. If it's not that, it's PUD. Those are the big threes. These other ones are... Cancer is number four, but these other ones are rare. Uh, maybe it's a stone, a gallstone. So biliac tract disorders can cause organic dyspepsia. Uh, colithiasis or biliary colic uh, with colithiasis with biliary tract or biliary colic can usually they have a classic presentation. They have this colicky pain, but early on it could represent stomach upset. Um, so it could be mistaken. Just a side note here, in case I don't get to gallbladder, which I might not. You know, I have over 3,000 slides for this class, right? I can never get to all the stuff in here. Um, but here, this is a great picture. So here's gallstones. So you got gallstones. Usually they don't cause any trouble. They hang out here. But every now and then, one little mischievous one gets down in the neck here of the gallbladder and gets stuck. And holy ass, the gallbladder freaks out and it doesn't like it there. And you start a peristaltic contractions with the gallbladder to try to blast it through. Sometimes you blast it through and pass it. Uh, then they get stuck down here. But this is all has muscle. This tube has muscle and it can it has a peristaltic wave. And it's severe pain when this occurs. Uh, so it's a crescendo, decrescendo pain. I think we'll talk about that in lab, but that's a colicky pain where the pain ramps up and then it backs off and ramps up and it's trying to squirt that stone right out of there. When that starts out early before the crescendo decrescendo starts, maybe for a day or two, uh, or maybe longer, maybe the stone pops out naturally and it keeps popping in and popping out. So it could be a cause of dyspeptic symptom. Of GI infections, so these are more rare, but tuberculosis, uh, G, uh, Giardia, the parasite gang, tuberculosis, the norovirus, uh, the E. coli, the, the run-of-the-mill gang there can be a source of chronic pain if it hangs around. The run-of-the-mill GI viral infections that you're, you ate something bad and you're stomach's upset for a day or two. Those are not counted in this because those are really, really common. That goes away. The inflammatory disorders, the inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Those are inflammatory bowel disease. Celiac disease, I don't know if we get to that, but I definitely have YouTube videos on some of these that I don't get to. Should watch those before boards. Uh, eosinophilic, we talked about eosinophilic esophagitis. Did I cut that out? I might have cut that out this quarter. Um, can't remember. Uh, but you can also have the same thing in your stomach and in your small bowel. You can have a, an inflammation that is really eosinophilic heavy, and that's called eosinophilic, and then you name the location it occurred, esophagus, stomach, intestine. That can do it as well. Here's some here's some other cause. These are the less co common causes. Even Mr. Spock's like raising an eyebrow. It's like what the hell of it? Uh, thyroid disease, and we don't know the mechanisms of some of these, but they are associated with it. Uh, adrenal insufficiency, uh, hyperparathyroidism, gastroparesis, acute myocardial ischemia could present as stomach ache. That's a dangerous one, right? That's a Pre precursor to a heart attack. You're getting some angina, so you gotta you gotta check that one out. Uh, food triggers that makes sense, right? Chili, especially if you have GERD, chili, chocolate, all the 
bad foods to eat for GERD, alcohol. They can all trigger GERD. Uh, and then medications are really common. NSAIDs, a lot of people take NSAIDs and they wonder why their stomach hurts. They can cause full-blown peptic ulcers. We talked a lot about them. And about 10% 10 of the users, not 0.01, 10% of the users. Uh, even COX-2s. Actually, my recording's still going up, still going, my safety recording. Uh, even COX-2 inhibitors can do this, uh, can cause trouble. Aspirin, iron supplements, narcotics, uh, antibiotics, right? You might be given antibiotics uh, thinking that you have some kind of bacteria running wild in your intestine. And the medication also causes upstomach. stomach. That's really common. Uh, digoxin, digitalis for heart arrhythmias and heart failure, uh, sometimes not well tolerated by the stomach. Estrogen, levodopa for Parkinson's disease, sometimes not well tolerated by the stomach. All right, let's get to, I should have started my clock because I have no idea how. All I know is the sawing and everything has stopped, so that's nice. Functional dyspepsia, let's dig into that a little bit. I think I should go through this a little more. Um, so much more common than organic dyspepsia. And this means that you have stomach pain for six months or a year, and you finally get in to see the GI doc. He does a barium swallow. He does a upper GI. Uh, he does a colonoscopy, looking for causes. He can't find anything. So you get labeled nerd if you if you think it's GERD related. If it's not GERD related, then you're in the your pain is called functional dyspepsia. So there's no cause uh, that we can find. But there's some pretty good research on why this happens. We'll look at that in a minute. There's, fact, there's actually eight of these things uh, that are well studied. Some are more likely than the others, but delayed gastric emptying, impaired gastric accommodation to meal, hypersensitivity to gastric distension, altered duodenal sensitivity to lipid or acid, abnormal intestinal mobility, CNS. We'll get in, let's get into a few of these interesting ones. Delayed gastric emptying means... Um, just like it says, you eat food and your stomach is slow like a turtle and that food and acid sits in your stomach way too long. Normally it takes, according to Guyton Schlesinger, it takes about six hours to completely empty your stomach after a normal meal. Uh, and people who have dyspepsia, they're in the lab and their stomachs are tested. It can take almost 12 hours in some cases, twice as long for the stomach to empty. Uh, so all that digestive juice sitting around can irritate the stomach lining, and it, some of it will get out into the intestine. It can irritate that as well. About 35% of people with functional dyspepsia who've been tested in the lab actually have confirmed delayed gastric emptying. Trouble with this, sensitivity and specificity isn't the greatest, but nevertheless, that's one possible cause. Uh, impaired gastric accommodation, about 40%. Are found with this so it's a little bit stronger correlation uh, and remember the stomach has a very tricky neurological feat uh, to perform uh, this is your esophagus here I'm out of room so let's draw a stomach like this there's your stomach so when you got food down here in the stomach it's all packed with food uh, the pyloric region of the stomach has to grind this stuff up I mean, there's hamburgers and birds and bats and who knows what's down here. But it's got to be smashed up. So peristalsis has to occur here. But as more and more food comes down, uh, your stomach starts to fill up. So where does this smashed food go? It has to go in the fundic region of the stomach. So this has to relax and this has to be working. And so that's what most of our normal stomachs do. But that's a pretty tough neurological feat to accomplish. And they've tested this. They can put balloons in here, and they can, just like mammometry, it's kind of mammometry for your stomach, they can tell where the grinding is occurring. And a lot of people with, uh, with dyspepsia, functional dyspepsia, they have their whole stomach cranking down. And super high pressures are registered, and those pressures are enough to trigger nociceptors in the stomach wall. 
Okay, so everything I just said, stomach grinds up that food normally. Everything I said, proximal stomach fails to relax. This is impaired accommodation and super high pressures occur. And that's enough to trigger pain sensors. Uh, and if you go down with endoscopic evaluation, what are you going to see? Nothing, right? This is a problem with the coordination of the stomach during digestion. All right, um, another one. So distension hypersensitivity. These people can't tolerate. These are the people with postprandial fullness. They get any food in there and their stomach, they can't stand any type of stretching in it at all. And it sets off pain or discomfort. Uh, this is thought to be the, one of the major causes of functional uh, GI disorder. So it's strongly researched. Uh, it's quite common. So they have a visceral hypersensitivity. So they have an abnormal perception of pain once any stretch is put on the stomach wall. Very similar to allodynia, right? These people also have more chronic pain. There's a good relation to this stuff. Uh, even below normals of gastric pressure set these people off when they test them, when they put balloons in their stomach. Uh, when they put people without just normal without any uh, dyspeptic complaints. When they do volunteers, they can crank those balloons up. It doesn't bother them all. They say, oh, my stomach's pretty full, but it doesn't hurt or anything like that. Um, so that's kind of the deal with that. And why did I put this in here? Pancreas. Here's the pancreas. Remember the pancreas? Tail, body, neck, head. What's that called? Here's an anatomy tip for you. What's this called right here? If my memory serves, that's the uncinate process. This is the head. You guys always get that confused, right? That's the head of the pancreas. But the neck is right in this region. Body, and the tail is this end piece right here. Anyway, that's the pancreas. You can see how it's cradled in the duodenum. Oh, that's not what we're, we're supposed to look at the duodenum. Remember, it's got this kind of part one, part two, part three, part four. So a transverse part or superior part, descending, inferior part. There's AKs for these parts. Inferior part, ascending part. Or uh, Gray says part one, two, three, and four. So, I mean, you could easy to remember them that way. So duodenal acid sensitivity is another one. So... Uh, Dyspeptic patients tend to be hypersensitive to stomach acid in the duodenum. Your stomach's be, should, your duodenum is supposed to be able to tolerate a little bit of acid. And this is not overproduction of acid. This is normal levels of acid. Uh, and they can't. So volunteers, you can, in normal stomachs, you can inject tons of acid into the duodenum. It doesn't give them any symptoms. You do that in someone with dyspeptic plates and they immediately have pain. Um, so, duodenal acid sensitivity research shows many functional dyspeptic patients do indeed have abnormally high levels. To, so, to make things even worse, uh, they secrete abnormally high levels of HCL on their abnormally sensitive duodenum. So, kind of a double whammy there. Uh, why do they have HCL? Uh, they have loose pyloric sphincters. Uh, some research says that the bicarbonate secretion from Brunert's glands, that's the job of, remember, B for Brunert's, B for bicarbonate, uh, they don't work very good. There's gene mutations that are associated with that as well. Uh, and then, so I think this is the last. We're getting near the end, I think. It seems like we're going forever. Probably because I didn't take any break. Uh, but psychological factors are depression, anxiety. Uh, that's a known cause of stomach upset for a long, long time. Uh, so divorce, death of a loved one, health issues, loss of a job, trauma would be in there. Any type of huge stress, financial trouble. Um, so another common one. This one's related to low back problems, too. So 
patients with somatoform disorder. They're trying. They call it somatic symptom disorder now. I learned it as somatoform disorder. It's kind of stuck in my brain. Somatization, somatization disorder. Um, these people are at really high risk for having not only chronic pain but functional dys dyspepsia. Uh, so it occurs when a patient experiences real pain but they get worked up and they can't find any cause for the real pain. How many times do we have that in low back pain patients? Uh, so it has been associated with chronic back pain, very well studied, there's no doubt about it. Some particularly red flags for stomach troubles, go to the GI doc, they always ask you about this stuff. History of any type of abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, um, can you can manifest that as stomach upset, anxiety? People with anxiety have increased dyspeptic in this diagnosis of dyspepsia. People with depression, the same thing. So, how do you treat functional dyspepsia? Especially, I mean, you can't really identify the cause. Uh, well, mental. I mean, you as health primary health care providers, you can reassure the patient that, hey, you, you know, we did tests, you don't have cancer, everything looks fine, we don't understand this dyspeptic condition that you have, but the research does say that it tends to go away with the passage of time. Sometimes it can take a couple years. Same with sciatica and uh, annular tears can take years to go away in some people. Uh, eat smaller amounts of food, uh, go see a psychologist, get some some of that therapy, uh, antidepressants if you need them, patient needs them, eat smaller meals, more frequent meals, uh, avoid all the GERD, irritating conditions, spicy foods, alcohol, coffee, tea, red sauce, chocolate, stop smoking, uh, and then take Tums. I mean, after a meal, try Tums, maybe it is GERD, you got to experiment. Uh, there's this sacrophate, which binds to duodenal and gastric ulcers even before they're really forming. It works pretty good. I think it's actually over the counter now, if I remember right. So that's something you can try if you suspect an ulcer starting. Um, this misoprostol is another drug. I actually don't have too much experience. I could probably take that out of there. Prokinetic drugs, they work, but the trouble is uh, the best ones are banned. There's all si uh, kind of side effects that are negative and scary with those things. Uh, medications, of course, the H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors can be tried. Um, big meta-analysis came out a couple years ago. Uh, showed that the H2 blockers and PPIs uh, beat placebo trial, uh, placebo sugar pills. Were given. They looked exactly like the PPIs and H2 blockers. They were manufactured to look exactly the same. Uh, and sure enough, they did significantly help people with functional dyspepsia. So that's always the best thing to start out with before you even stick a scope down there. If it continues and they don't work, always suspect H. pylori. Uh, so you can destroy that H. pylori with a double dose of antibiotics. I don't think we talked about it this time. Used to talk about how it's you have to do a double dose of antibiotics and it's you can't be lazy with that. Um, yep, so that's uh, not just me. The famous Cochrane meta analysis studies support that, which are super evidence based. They don't accept money from anybody. And uh, eradicating HP might increase the acid, but the HP can really irritate the stomach lining no matter what phase it's in. Hey, we did it. We're going to stop here in stomach lining conditions. I owe you uh, two more lectures on CVPP, which I will do tomorrow morning. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, not so much because we have testing next week. Uh, so, yep. We'll see you later.